Hey friends, welcome to Make Anything. I missed ya. It's been a while since the last video, but I have not slowed down and that's why we've got a pretty crowded table today. Since my last numbers video, I've been churning these things out. All sorts of different numbers, and these are just a handful. But I thought I'd show them all together in the same video today because they have a common thread. In today's video, I'm not going to go into the whole process of making all three of these numbers because, as you can imagine, there's a lot that went into it. But I will go into detail with this number six, and then I might talk about these two as well, just to show you the differences. But they're all kind of similar. It's all about this idea of stitching into wood, and I think it's pretty cool. So let's get right into it and see what went into making one of these numbers. I'll start my design in Adobe Illustrator with this number six. It's Avenir Bold, one of my favorite fonts, but like most fonts, it doesn't have a consistent width all the way around. That's important for this design, so what I did was just trace over that six with my own strokes. These strokes have that consistent width, so I just trimmed it up and made it into this six right here. This stroke also gives me a center line for my number six, so I can create a thinner stroke following that path, offset it several times, and I'll get all of these concentric rows right here. These lines basically represent the path that my stitches are going to take, but what I want to do is actually use it to create the holes that my stitches will be running through. So I'll select all these lines and turn them into dashed lines. I'll set the dash width to zero, which effectively makes perfect circles, and then I'll make the gap nine millimeters to space it how I want. There we go, now we can see all the holes that I have to drill into this number six. From there, I just expanded the appearance and converted all of these circles into really little tiny circles, and I also created this offset version of the six, which will help me create a border that I can stick behind my front piece. All of these different strokes are gonna be exported as a DXF file and brought into Fusion 360. And the process here was very much like my number twos that I made with a bunch of screws. So check out that video if you wanna see this part more in depth. But basically you can see the toolpath here that I programmed, all of these holes that are gonna be going all the way through this piece of three quarter inch plywood, and then we'll cut the outline. All those holes are gonna be drilled with this quarter inch brad point bit this one in particular is relatively pricey for a single bit, but it had excellent reviews and I'm drilling hundreds of holes, so I want a bit that will hold up for the whole process. I'll also turn my spindle speed all the way down to the lowest setting because even that 5,000 RPM is pretty fast for a drilling operation. Here I am testing out the bit and my drilling operation on a scrap piece of plywood. And even though it would make this really shrill sound every now and then, the holes themselves were looking super clean, and that's all the validation I needed to run the actual process. You can see how much sawdust was being ejected here because the holes are being drilled rather deep, and my vacuum system was a little bit clogged as I was doing this cut. That's fine, but I do think I was cutting my holes a little bit too aggressively as the Z axis seemed to slip near the end of the operation so that some of my holes didn't cut all the way through. Also in general, the exit holes were pretty splintered as that last ply of the plywood kind of exploded as the drill was passing all the way through. A rough surface like this would definitely make it harder to feed our paracord through these holes. So I decided to try fixing both of these problems by putting this under the CNC once again, face down, and cutting a pocket in the back. As you can see, I'm actually using the scrap wood from my first cut, but flipping it upside down so that I can align the six back onto the CNC just flipped over. And that'll allow me to cut away at the back and have it relatively aligned, at least as well as I need it to be for this particular operation I'm doing here. And I'm also using the tape and super glue method to hold my piece down. So I have these pieces of tape stuck on the bed of the CNC as well as on my piece. And then I'll put a nice healthy serving of Starbond cyanoacrylate between those two to glue it all together without actually damaging the surface of my piece. 
I'll put some pressure on the top with these paint cans until the super glue dries, and then we can go ahead and run this second operation. Here I'm using a one inch diameter surfacing end mill to do this adaptive clearing operation. And I cut away about three millimeters of the surface, which was just enough to open up all the holes that didn't go all the way through. And it left me with a much cleaner bottom surface. Next up, I wanna stain this plywood to get a nice dark walnut finish. But before I do that, I'll go ahead and fill up any small holes we have on the side of the plywood using this Minwax Stainable Wood Fill. And while this top surface is already pretty smooth, I'll just go ahead and run over it with some 220 grit sandpaper to make sure it's completely smooth. I'll follow that up with some Minwax Pre-Stain Wood Conditioner, wiped on with this terry cloth sponge. And after about five minutes, I'll go ahead and wipe away any excess conditioner. After that, I'll go ahead and apply my dark walnut stain. Instead of using that same sponge to apply this stain, I like to just use an old rag that's a little less absorbent because I've found that applying thin coats of this stain helps get a more even finish. However, I did have trouble getting stain inside of the holes themselves, and I was worried that you would be able to see that even with the paracord running through it all, so I ended up soaking those areas just to get the stain down into those holes and then wiping away the excess and I did end up getting a really nice finish. Once I've given that stain some time to dry, I'll go ahead and glue down these additional borders that I made for the back of the piece. This just makes the entire piece look twice as thick, giving it a more expensive and luxurious look. After clamping that overnight, it's time to apply a polyurethane coat, and I'll be using this Minwax Glossy Polyurethane Spray. You know, back in college, I was always nervous to use gloss coats on my projects just because they'll show every little imperfection. But I've actually found this polyurethane spray to be extremely forgiving. You can put on a pretty healthy coat and it'll generally even out quite well. And the shiny finish that it leaves just makes the piece look that much more professional. So there you have the woodworking portion of this project, but of course it's the stitching that is the more unique feature on this particular number. So let's go ahead and learn how to do that. The stitching is actually based directly on a embroidery technique called the chain stitch. This technique really isn't too difficult, although it can be tricky to show it on the piece itself since we are working on both sides. So I thought I would make this little piece of acrylic and drill some holes into it so that I can demonstrate the technique in a more clear manner. For this piece, I'll be using this four millimeter nylon paracord. It's great because it's super sturdy and it's slippery enough to easily feed through the holes. We'll start off by melting the end of this rope using a lighter so that it doesn't fray any further. And then we can start our stitch. So like I said, this is based on the embroidery chain stitch, but the technique is a bit different. We'll start by making a loop at the very beginning and feeding it through from the back, like so. Then we'll take another small length of cord and make another loop and push it through the second hole. From here, we just take the first loop and feed it over the second loop. And then we can pull that loop through. And that's basically a single stitch. Just make sure to keep the rope nice and taut from one stitch to the next, because that helps keep it looking nice and even. That's pretty much all there is to it. Feed through a loop and then take the loop before and run it over and through. Like I said, it's actually easier than embroidering with fabric because with a needle and thread, you just have to pull the thread through. With this technique, you don't have to feed the entire length of paracord through every hole. You just push one loop through at a time and that's really what makes this possible. For the last hole, we'll take this loop from the top and push it through to the back. Then you can cut off the remaining paracord and feed it through that loop on the bottom. Just pull it through like so, and then you could finish it off with any standard knot. Now, my stitches are a little bit lumpy, not as nice as they could be. That takes a bit of practice and finesse. So for my final number, I just went ahead and handed the task over to my resident embroidery expert, Natalie 
and she did a much better job than I could have. Here you can see the way she does it a little bit differently than me in the sense that she really pulls every single stitch really tight and that's how she was able to get these really clean, consistent stitches. Here's the back of our piece once all those stitches are done and tied off at the end. Although, as I mentioned, this nylon paracord is pretty slippery and knots tend to untie themselves. So to really seal it, we'll go ahead and melt those knots into a single glob of nylon plastic and that makes sure there's no way that this is coming undone. Here we've got an end that was cut a little bit too short to actually tie into a knot, but I was still able to melt it down enough to actually seal it. It's also just really satisfying to watch these ends melt down. Anyways, once we've sealed off those knots, our piece is complete. And here we have our finished number six. With this close up, you can really see the amazing job that Natalie did making these really tight and consistent stitches all along the number six. Now for this second stitch number, a lot of the process was the same. Although instead of having a wooden backing, I went ahead and did a painted background for this piece. And as you can see, the holes are also cut as slots instead of circles, and that's made specifically for this giant yarn that I got. This stuff is super fun and fluffy, a bit trickier to work with just because of how chunky it is, but nevertheless, Natalie was able to pull it off, and in the end, she did a fantastic job. For the areas where the stitches cross over one another, we just went ahead and did these kind of stretched out stitches underneath the back of the piece, and that's how we got the overlapping effect of the stitches on the front. One additional step I took with this number was to add a back panel with half inch plywood, and to do that I just used wood glue and finishing nails all around the border to hold down all of that giant yarn that kind of wanted to burst out from the back. Of course, I could have just used a pneumatic air gun like I have with other numbers, but in this case, I wanted to be particularly careful, so I just went ahead and used finishing nails by hand. And here we have the final piece. I think it's pretty awesome how different this four looks from the six, considering they basically used the same techniques. Finally, we have that other four you saw at the beginning of this video, which is a wrapped paracord number four. And this is the easiest of the bunch because it literally is just about wrapping paracord around the number and stapling it down on the back. Although you can see that I actually cut out little notches on the CNC, which helped me space out the paracord evenly as I wrap it around. Besides that, I just made sure to keep the paracord nice and tight and I stapled it down every two wraps just because the width of the staples are about equal to the width of two lines of paracord. So that worked out really well. Here's the back of the piece, and I'm pretty proud of how nice and neat I kept it. But of course, it's all about the front, and that came out wonderful as well. This alder wood stained with Minwax's special walnut finish just looks absolutely superb, especially paired with this nice teal paracord. This is yet another number where I'm extremely happy with the final result. If anything, maybe I would have packed the paracord a little bit more tightly because there are some gaps between the rope, but as a whole, it still looks fantastic. So there you have it, three of my latest numbers. I think they all came out really great and uh, there may be another stitched number coming in the future before all is said and done. 
But even beyond that, I'm really excited, especially with this giant yarn, to try to translate this to other projects. I think this technique would be super cool combined with some kind of wooden furniture piece. I really want to try that out, so look forward to that in the future. Um, yeah, but that's it for today. Um, I don't know if this is the last video for 2019. I'm pretty sure it will be. So I just want to say thank you guys so much. Uh, by the time this video comes out, I may have hit 400,000 subscribers, which is amazing. I've been basically trending 100,000 per year, which is awesome. But you know what? For 2020, I'm trying to dream big. I want to hit a million subscribers in 2020. Uh, you think I can do that? Yeah, it's ambitious, but I know there's a lot of you out there rooting for me. And if you do want to support this channel, please share your favorite Make Anything video from this past year. Share it on your social media, maybe get some friends to subscribe, and if you're not subscribed, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Let's do this, makers. But that's it for today's video. So until next time, I'm Devin, this is Make Anything, and as always, stay inspired. <laughs>